You might be wondering why it is I decided to start this video with a long, continuous, hypnotic, almost never-ending still look at this one badly compressed JPEG. I will admit, among my editing choices over the years, it's gotta be one of my most boldest and most stunningest. But there is a reason, there is a reason, for why I've yet to change what's currently on the screen, or move it, or give it a drop shadow, or even put it on a background. You need to take this character design in. You need to look at it. Feel it. Taste it! Lick your screen right now! I don't care what you're watching on, do it! This is an order! Can you tell me what it tastes like? Cold and bitter and totally without flavor? Well, good news. You're a sheep. And it's nice to know I can manipulate you so easily like that. Maybe next time I can get you to buy the plushie that way. No, I'm not over that. But also, that taste you just got is a perfect distillation of how I feel about this character design for the Disney Plus TV show, Monsters at Work. As I'm writing this, I haven't even watched the show yet, but God. God, this character design, it's immaculate, it's visionary, it's... Has it been 30 seconds yet? Okay, good. It's fucking bullshit! What the absolute... What? Who approved this? This is disgusting! <laughs> and before you ask me why I'm getting so angry at this background character for a series that's also a sequel to Monsters, Inc., which would obviously have Mike Wazowski and James Sullivan, two greatly designed characters at the forefront, he's the main character! This guy, not these guys, this guy! He's the one we're gonna be following through this new series of adventures that supposedly have almost nothing to do with Mike or Sully. You know, one of the greatest best friend dynamics in animated film history? Uh-huh, they're upstaged by this fucking monstrosity. And when I say that, I don't mean monstrosity in like a cool, scary, Lovecraftian sort of way. I mean shit that makes the minions look like they had more thought put into them. Was this based on the series developer's kid's first drawing of a monster or something? Oh, daddy, I know what a monster looks like. He, uh, 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 he got long pointers, and a tail, and he's purple, and very scary. Fuck, Fuck you. you. Tell me one thing about this character design that distinguishes him and makes you think, I see, that must be the main character. He's got no unique qualities, about as basic a body type as you can imagine, a blank expression and posture that doesn't say anything about his personality or mannerisms, and you want to take a swing at what his name is? Tyler Tusman. Jesus goddamn fuck, did you even try? Could you possibly think of a more generic, indistinguishable, forgettable name in this kind of universe? He doesn't even have tusks, those are horns! And I found the other main character models too, woo boy, look at these. We got a gender-bent, less distinctive version of Art from Monsters University, another gender-bent of the crab dude from MU, this one guy that looks like if they took the base of a soft rectangle and put on whatever miscellaneous monster appendages they had lying around, and this one... Actually, his design is okay. It conveys a character type when I look at him. He isn't derivative of something else. He doesn't feel like a background character. This one's all right. But the others? Trash. Terrible. Abhorrent. There was no thought put into any of these. And I could look past an uninspired or non-appealing design on most occasions if the show had other qualities to better personify it. But this is Monsters, Inc! The franchise that, to this day, has some of Pixar's best, most iconic designs. I put up a picture of James Sullivan. What do you think he's like? Well, his big stature, smile, and glossy fur tell me he's friendly and soft. Maybe a bit clumsy occasionally, but at the same time, with his sharp teeth, claws, and whatnot, he's also got the capacity to be really scary under the right circumstances. Mike Wazowski? Charming and goofy thanks to his natural grin and laid-back expression, but equally capable of being witty. Randall Boggs? Do I even need to explain this one? You know exactly what he's like from one image. It's amazing, memorable, recognizably unique characterization. Even in M.U., a movie I made a video about that lots of people like to sleep on, it carries on the tradition and keeps up great looks for characters like Squishy and Art. You might have forgotten their names if you weren't paying attention, but for sure you remember what they look like, and that tells you all you need to know about how they act. What kind of personality traits do you see when you look at Tyler Tuskman? Because all I see is a guy that enjoys Starbucks pumpkin spice lattes, sings Disney songs and karaoke, and when you ask him what his favorite band is, he says, oh, I listen to everything. That's Tyler Tuskman, the least interesting, most undeserving of their own series type of character you could imagine. And surprisingly, he didn't always look this unendingly bland. During a Google search for images of Tyler, I found old promotional images advertising the announcement of the series before it was finalized. 2001 Mike and Sully models and all, which gave him a design that, while still definitely less than original, has the makings of a character. He's lean and awkward and clearly a newbie to the job. It's got the smallest bit of thought put into it. But then they changed him into the blandest person in existence. Is that what he's actually like? I don't know. I haven't watched the series yet since these shitty designs have deterred me into thinking it'll be a boring slog fest, the worst kind of experience I could have when consuming a piece of media. In all honesty, I've thought about leaving this as a short rant about the importance of modeling characters around their respective characteristics to better 
distinguish them. Seeing as that should be incredibly obvious, yet somehow Monsters at Work fails where its predecessor excelled. But that wouldn't make for as entertaining or thorough a piece of side content as I like to work on between major releases, and admittedly, the concept does intrigue me. Serving as an immediate sequel to Monsters, Inc., after the cast discovers children's laughter is way more powerful than Scream's ever were, it partially follows Sully and Mike as they attempt to integrate professional scarers into the world of comedy with Waternoose, their previous boss, out of the picture. Plus, they got the original voices of the duo, Jonathan Goodman and Billy Crystal, back to reprise their roles, so that's also a plus and should help to make the series feel not as far off from the original film as it actually is. Really, that concept on its own sounds like a great idea for a series with a lot of potential for comedic misadventures using characters we've already come to love. But for some reason, I'm guessing budget since Goodman and Crystal can't be cheap hires, their stories are supposedly shoved off to the side so we can focus on Tyler and another group of monsters in the company, Miffed, who do all the repairs and technical stuff so the building keeps functioning. And well, as I've made abundantly clear, I hate almost all of their designs, that is also a fun idea that could explore a side of the company we've never come to know. I mean, Monsters University was all about saying that scaring isn't the only option for monsters who want to work at a big company, but they never demonstrate all too much on that besides a few quick gags about scream canisters. I could see this working with the right cast, but Tyler's the main character of the series, getting center focus in all the marketing, and if he's as forgettable a character as his design is, I'm going to fucking scream. So BRB, gonna go watch the show so I can tell you if I was right to avoid it. One hour later. Okay, I know I just got back, but I gotta go and scream at myself for making such poor life decisions. <clears throat> So needless to say, Tyler's design 100% captures how he is as a character and on-screen presence. He has no particular hobbies, non-work-related skills, or interesting personality traits other than, Oh geez, I don't really want to be here, so I'll be like, mildly annoyed and a little sarcastic, Rick. Even his backstory and motivation are so weak. His whole dilemma across the series is that, since Monsters, Inc. runs on laugh power instead of screams, he needs to train so he can become a jokester, and until that time comes, he'll work with Mift, who are almost all completely insufferable to me. But how would he end up in this predicament in the first place? Well, according to the show, when Tyler went to Monsters University, and trust me, this show loves unsubtly and unfunnily referencing the original films, he was the top scarer, even more so than Sully himself. We already mentioned this when Sully was never top scarer and got expelled before his first year was over, but whatever. To the point Sully invited Tyler to work at Monsters, Inc. mere days before they made the switch. So now with all this knowledge on how to be an amazing scarer and nothing else, Tyler's left completely out of place. Which, first of all, I want to call bullshit on? Sully was intentionally created so that he was fluffy and welcoming, but had the capacity to be scary. It's part of what makes his design so ingenious. Then you look at Tyler and... What's scary about this anorexic Barney the Dinosaur of Horns looking motherfucker? I can't grasp what would make him particularly scary to a kid in any way. This is part of why Monsters, Inc. was so impressive and that it could encapsulate both ideas into a design and still be totally believable. It's a hard balance. But Tyler? For sure, there wasn't a single intentional decision put into him. The executives that wanted the show told the crew we need a main character in five seconds, and this is what they came up with. A bland, boring, unremarkable straight man that's so straight and two-dimensional, you'd think if he tripped he'd fall down like a cardboard cutout. But you can't have a terrible straight man without an equally bad rogues gallery for him to not bounce off of. So who are these poorly illustrated deviant OCs? Going from, I guess, most tolerable to least? Cutter is probably the easiest of the group for me to ignore, since she has the least lines or attempts at development, and is mostly predicated on two running gags. She likes to take her lunch break, and whenever the opportunity comes, she likes to mention how many monsters have died doing various jobs for Mift. It's not much, but considering how the other members of Mift are expanded on, that's really her most likable quality. She's simple and not in your face about it, a trait all the other Mifters are sorely missing. Duncan is an interesting case. At first, I thought he was going to be the only member of the team I enjoyed, seeing as much like myself, he hated being there, didn't like Tyler, and was waiting for one of the characters to die so he could take his place. But then, weirdly, it ended up being an incredibly rare phenomenon where I started out liking the character, but gradually grew to hate him. First of all, I just love his voice. The others aren't great either, but his gets super annoying the more you have to listen to it. So as you could imagine, I was absolutely pounding my screen during the episodes where he was a main focus. But worse than that, he's the definition of a character the writers want you to hate at first and grow to like after learning sympathetic details about, but those sympathetic details never come. Episode five tried to go for that by revealing that Duncan's entire life mission is to become the supervisor of Myth, which is why it's so important to him. But you want to guess what we don't get? Why? What causes him to yearn so badly for this position and basically act like a supervillain trying to keep everyone else away from it? What's so special to him about being Miss Supervisor? I don't know. But the series treats him revealing that it's his life goal as if we should understand why he's been such a massive dick up to that point. Except, it doesn't. Without proper motivation, it's kinda just pathetic. And he keeps acting like a dick afterwards, so... 
What's the point? Why go to the trouble of peeling back the layers when he's not gonna develop in any significant way? He's an asshole at the start and an asshole at the end. Though maybe it's better he and Tyler didn't become friends by the end of the season. At least their hatred for one another wasn't the result of manipulation and god-awful poorly explained drama. Yeah, I'm lumping the boss Fritz and the girl that Tyler knew from one class in college Val together, seeing as they virtually have the same eccentricities. They're quirky and socially inept and not too aware of their surroundings, so they talk on and on, you know, in that sort of I'm rambling so much, isn't that charming, I don't know when to stop, tee hee, kinda way. And that's already plenty enough to despise them for. But what I hate most about them is how they attempt to befriend Tyler and turn him into a mifter. Imagine you're in his position. Shouldn't be too difficult when Tyler's such an unremarkable lead. You've made it to the dream profession you spent years working towards, but they've changed up their whole game and sent you to work with the maintenance crew while you train to be ready for the company's new style. Alright, doesn't sound too bad, temporary position and all. But then, when you get there, the maintenance crew is a little too comfortable saying you'll make a great part of the team. You try to tell them that you're not gonna stay and plan to get out as soon as you're qualified for the new position, but they aren't listening. They inaugurate you into their gang, act as though they've known you for way longer than they have, and the one person in the group you'd already met during a brief period in college acts like you two are best buds and tells everyone at the office that that's the case. And then, when you've finally had enough of this girl shoving it in your face that you went to school together despite barely ever speaking, she gives you a sad sob story on the world's smallest violin about how no one noticed her when she got to college, but you said hello, and she's hung on to that one interaction ever since, as she has never made any other friends outside of her work and has basically been waiting for you to show up. Having heard that, would you A, call her out for being such an inconsiderate person, unwilling to listen to what you've had to say about not being close friends, B, tell her off for never actually trying to know or understand you as a person, but continue to label you as her bestest friend based on a simple interaction you two had, C, back away slowly because if she's willing to manipulate you into liking her and willing to go so far believing this delusion that you're best friends, it's not a stretch to think she'd carry a knife and chloroform just in case, or D, play into her delusions and become actual friends instead of calling out her obvious manipulative tendencies since her plan worked and you now feel sympathy. Shouldn't be too hard to get what option the series took. It's so infuriating watching Fritz and Val try so hard to get Tyler antiquated to miffed without ever taking his own feelings into account. I'm pretty sure they don't even perceive what he says to them when he says it. Like, in the second episode, Fritz is attempting the whole permanent inauguration thing and Tyler tells him that's not going to be the case rather vocally, but Fritz doesn't respond. I swear this guy must either have cognitive dissidence, or he's really just that much of an asshole to act like, Oh, why would he go to comedy classes after all we've done for him? Then later on, during the times where Tyler wants to impress the higher-ups at Monsters, Inc., such as in episode 4, Val's all, I know you'd never do anything that blatantly selfish. Just acting blind to the fact Tyler doesn't want to be there in spite of him literally yelling it to their faces. But that's not how the show treats it, no, no, no. This isn't supposed to be an I'm stuck with crazy people that drive me insane type of series. The crew obviously wants us to think of it as an underdog meets misfits who he warms up to over time deal, and yes, Tyler does do that, but it isn't natural at all. Sure, the show will be willing to tell us all about how Duncan wants the supervisor job and that Val was lonely as a kid and Fritz cares for him like a son, so we should all feel bad for them and hope Tyler warms up to them. But you know who we don't get to hear from about all this in a way that would make sense? Tyler. He has no opinion about anything. Why? Because he's Tyler Tuskman, a living tofu block and conductor for the writer's morals. It doesn't matter that Duncan's been nothing but an asshole to him from the moment they met. Now that he's told Tyler his lacking, unspecific backstory, he's willing to lose his own job so Duncan can stay. Why get mad at Fritz or Val for never listening to Tyler and pushing the idea that not being a mifter is inconsiderate to them? They've tried so hard to welcome him. The least he can do is reciprocate. And in the last few episodes, we're led to believe that he's going to embrace being a full-time mifter, something I thought was a foregone conclusion based on how much the series pushed for him to work there, but then, at the very last moment, Val and Fritz read Tyler's acceptance letter and understand he wanted to work on the laugh floor this whole time. Yeah? Yeah, buddy? You think that might be the case? Of course, after reading this, they don't reflect on their own actions, and they never acknowledge how selfish slash inconsiderate they were to Tyler for the whole thing, but hey, twist ending. Tyler works on the laugh floor now. Their previous transgressions are forgiven. Woohoo! Please shoot me. And where were Mike and Sully in all this? Ha! <laughs> well, that's how they get you, isn't it? I thought that maybe, just maybe, based on commercials for the show, that individual plots were going to be evenly split between the new cast and the old, giving us a bit of a dichotomy and diversity in story. Story. But no, that's what they do for the first three, kind of, four episodes, and to be completely upfront, the segments with Mike and Sully were even less entertaining than the shit with Mift, but then they just phase out. 
Sorry, did you want to see your favorite characters continue their adventures simultaneously with the new ones? Nope, sorry, not happening. They don't matter anymore. We're gonna shove them off to a two minute ending section most people will skip over. Out with the old and with the new, am I right? Who needs beloved characters when we've got Tyler Tuskman? <laughs> and for that matter, why limit ourselves to stories about Myth's particular job and the fun situations it could come from? <laughs> Boring. We need an episode solely focused on how the boss will have to fire someone and the employees compete for the boss's affection only for it to turn out that the budget is fine. Gotta have a story about the main lead trying to impress the bored kid of an important person. Who could forget the classic, cast messes up and they need to hide their mistake from the surprise inspector. And what about bowling? Just regular fucking bowling. Not monster fiend bowling with unique rules and differences from the human world. It's bowling. They might throw the ball in a comedic way, but it's still bowling at the end of the day and nothing more. You remember that episode of Regular Show and Foster's Home and the Looney Tunes Show and The Simpsons and Hey Arnold where the cast gets together to play bowling and they usually suck or have to go up against a much stronger rival team? Distill those episodes into their least distinct features and you get this. But wait, Randall's gone. Who are they gonna have as a main rival? Holy shit, is that the blue Mike Wazowski? <laughs> They, 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 they really just shifted the hue on Mike's character model and called it a day, huh? That's some Cold Steel the Hedgehog type shit. I think I'm done here. So that's Monsters of Work. I didn't like it. Shallow characters, shallow stories, waste of a good concept, doesn't make use of its original cast enough, bad morals that never get called out. The most enjoyment I got out of the series was looking in the background of episode 8 to see they reused old 2001 stock models of Mike for picture frames. All around, a total mess that I'll hopefully forget about in a week's time. It's no wonder I never heard anyone talking about this after the first few episodes released. I have no idea how they did it, but the team behind this found a way to make the world of Monsters, Inc. boring. There was potential in the miffed concept to be completely fair but the writers didn't seem to have any original ideas for how to utilize it beyond those opening episodes. So the series stagnated after, and it's a shame. This was the first Disney cartoon continuation of a Pixar film since Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, an often underrated classic. So I was hoping this would be the same. Eh, maybe they'll make up for it in season two. Wait, season two? God damn it! I've been just stop, and you've been here before. Remember, please. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out, and happy new year.